All right, well, here we go. And welcome to Home Renovation DIY. I'm Jeff Thorman, your host, and we are doing live show again today. Today we are covering a very sensitive topic. So what I'm gonna ask everybody to do is just take a deep breath and try not to get offended too quickly so we can get through the information. Hopefully by the end, all of my comments and points will kind of conglomerate together to make a little bit of sense and it'll be some help to you moving forward. So today, of course, we are talking about <sighs> hiring a contractor. I know this is a DIY channel, but the reality is there are just some things you can't DIY, right? You're gonna have to call somebody for help at some point. And so today on the channel, we are going to be discussing the sensitive topic of how to find a contractor, how to get a good one, and how to get into a good contract, how to manage it so you can have a successful renovation. That's a lot. So we're gonna really dumb it down and go with simple points and we're gonna to try to get rid of a little bit of mystery here so that everybody can be on the same playing field when you're going into a contract. Now, we've had a little technical difficulty even getting started today. I'm gonna to have trouble reading your comments, so my son Matt is here, and he's gonna be asking me the questions that he sees on the screen, because honestly, this phone thing is not gonna work. I am too blind to see this. Really? <laughs> All right, so let's go. Um, before we get going, really heavily into this. Uh, I'm going to just do a little bit of uh, background information on contractors and who they are and what they are because there are really three types that I like to classify. Okay, there's the guy with the truck. That's classic and you can find him anywhere. They're available on Kijiji, uh, different websites with different lists, right? And you can find a guy with the truck, referral from a friend, you can see him parked at the Home Depot and he's got his phone number on a magnet on the side of the door. Generally speaking, the guy with the truck is a great handyman. And these are guys that you can call to do small tasks that are just physically outside of your toolbox if you're getting older or have disability issues or you have a fear of heights. You know, these are the guys you get to get up on the ladder for you. Sometimes these guys can even be skilled trades who are just working alone. And that is where they cross into what I have the next category of the crew. A crew is a guy with a truck who's hired somebody, maybe two guys, and he's got enough of a reputation that he has enough work lined up. That's important that he has employees, okay? Now there's one of the keys right there that you can flag. If a guy has got people that are working for him, he probably has enough work to keep them busy. That work is coming from somewhere. Whether or not it's coming from referral business or not is something you need to worry about. And we'll get into those checklists later. But a guy with a crew is the next level of business and he's not really a business in a lot of cases, he's him. One of the rules in business is if you can't sell it to somebody else, it's not really a business, okay? It's an individual who's hired staff. So you gotta think about that because in the world of contracting, if you get into bigger and bigger contracts, these small crews, in a lot of cases, aren't big enough to handle the responsibility and the liability if things go horribly wrong. And so you don't want to invest with a small crew when you're doing a major project unless you're really comfortable letting them do the work. Next, next category we want to talk about is the business. This is the real deal, okay? This is a company, and in my experience in the world today, in North America, if you have a business and you don't have 20 people working for you, you're in a really difficult niche. You're just big enough that you've got all the stress and headaches and you're working 80 to 100 hours a week to run your company, but you're not big enough yet that you can walk away from it and it'll run on its own. Now, we have that guy with the truck, the crew, and then the big business. And you have to decide for yourself which one you wanna hire because those three levels also charge out at different rates. The guy with the truck is the lowest cost, obviously, and the bigger the business, the more money you're gonna be spending. So let's talk about now the three major trade-offs. And are you watching my questions mm -hmm. for me? Oh yeah, 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 we got lots of mornings, the guys from England, a bunch of members in here too. Lots of, lots of, lots of shouting out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we really got to fix that so I can see it on my scroll <laughs> next time. Next I had an extra computer, guys, and I was going to be able to follow along, have my little pen, and I could scroll and keep up to date. So um, <laughs> this is going to be a little confusing. And I'm going to have to go through all these comments later and see who was watching the show. 
Matt, if uh, if we have any super chats, let me know and ask the question. Just cut me off and interrupt. 100%. Oh, yeah. Okay? Sure. That may be a good engagement rule for today. Now, anyway, let's get back to the conversation. When you're doing renovations at your home, there are three major concerns, right? The quality, the speed, like how long is it going to take, and how much is it going to cost? Now, there's an unwritten rule. You can't get the highest quality in the fastest amount of time for the lowest price. And if you're trying to find that, you're delusional and it's incredibly unrealistic, all right? If you find someone who promises the best quality at the fastest speed for the lowest price, they're delusional too. <laughs> and you're heading for disaster, all right? Most of the situations that I hear about for DIY renovations or contract situations, they have unrealistic expectations about the quality, the speed, and the money. And they get out of whack, all right? And so what we're gonna talk about today is how to find a good contractor largely depends on you being reasonable and establishing um, what I would call uh, healthy expectations, okay? To know, expect, know what you're gonna run into before you get started so you're not surprised, you're not increasing your stress level by thinking somehow it's gonna be a magical land, you're gonna get your whole kitchen gutted and rebuilt in six days and it's gonna go off without a hitch and you're gonna have that huge dinner party on the seventh day that you've been planning for three years. That kind of thing isn't gonna happen, so don't set yourself up for a fall, okay? Let's be realistic here. Now, in the quality and speed and money world, you can get high quality and high speed, but you're gonna pay for that. That scenario takes a, or a business with relationships and contractors and, and management skill, and man, I've been a part of a bunch of scenarios where we have done it, dance, right? We had, uh, we had a contract once, we were restoring from a fire in a retirement residence, and there were some um, special needs people there who had issues with Alzheimer's and they just could not handle the concept of being displaced from their unit. And so we had one lady in specifically who was really struggling with the idea of not being able to sleep in her own bedroom, but she had all kinds of smoke damage and the window was broken and we managed to put that unit together, are you ready for this, in nine hours. We rebuilt her unit in nine hours. Now, that was a bit of a miracle. We worked all night long and there were nine of us and we called in every favor we had in the book. We got it done and it was kind of fun getting that accomplishment done. So the technology is there, but you're not gonna get a good deal on that situation, okay? Next thing you can go is you can go fast and you can go cheap, but you may not be impressed with the product you have at the end of that contract. If you enter into a contract with somebody and they're gonna be quick and cheap, you, you have to manage your expectation here. It's gonna look like you did it yourself and you don't own tools, all right? So try to avoid those situations. Now, quick tip, if budget is an issue and that's your major concern, and let's talk real turkey. If quality is your major concern, then you focus on that. And don't worry about the speed and the, and the dollar sign. If speed is your major concern, then, then you focus on that. And, and you might have to sacrifice quality and pay a lot of money. But if the budget is the biggest concern, you're probably not gonna get quality and you're not gonna get speed. So there are ways that you can work around that. For instance, in our area, in the winter time, it's a lot slower for contractors. So if you have a budget issue, hiring a contractor for winter work sometimes is a great way to get a good deal. What would you say about friends and stuff like that? Like hiring buddies and stuff. We've had a couple people saying <laughs> right? they got screwed over, damaged roofs and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Recommended or no? Hmm. That's tough. Depends on the buddy. Right? Um, if you're hiring a friend to do a job and they're a professional, then you pay them as a professional. That's my rule. If you're hiring a professional to do a job, pay them the professional wage. Because the minute you treat them like a buddy, they're gonna not do their professional job. It's human nature. People cut corners when they're not getting compensated for it, right? And the end of the day, is the relationship more important than the roof? It's a great question, right? Now, if you've got a bunch of buddies who are in the trades and you wanna do a roof together, uh, then yeah, haul them all over, you know, throw some beer in the fridge, uh, order pizza for lunch, Hang out, it's like, it's like a, a working out and hanging out day, but you better be part of the action. Don't just release that responsibility to them. Manage the job, 
All right. Uh, what would you say to someone that wanted to amend a contract if the general contractor isn't holding subs to timelines? Amend a contract? Good luck. <laughs> we are going to talk about in my, my five rules for contracting. We're going to get to that in just a minute, and we'll talk about all of that as well. Um, so now that we're done dealing with the quality, speed, and the money, and realistic expectations, let's actually get into those, okay? Four rules for contract, sorry, five rules for contracting. Now this, these rules are, I, I sat down and really thought hard about it. I, I've designed them for, um, these rules are healthy relationship situations, okay? So whether you're the homeowner contracting a trademan, or you're in the trades and you're out signing contracts with homeowners, these five rules are great rules for both sides of the fence. If, you're, if both parties are operating under this kind of an umbrella, then you're gonna have a healthy relationship. Because remember, I might even get in trouble for this, but you know, uh, I was listening to Jordan Peterson one time. He said there's basically two kinds of relationships out there. There's negotiated and there's servant, okay? So if, let's talk about step number one of a healthy contracting relationship, negotiation, all right? If you're not negotiating a contract with your contractor, then you've become his servant. Yeah. Bottom line, mm -hmm. I'm gonna try to be as clear as I can here. When a guy walks through your door and he sets a contract on a table, that's years invested into that paperwork, okay? That's every life experience he's ever had, every life experience his lawyer's ever had, all the power of the law wrapped up in a document that favors him in every single situation. So no matter what kind of conflict you're having, he's already got it covered in that paperwork. Now, some guys don't have as good a contract as others, but if you go into a contract understanding the concept of when he pulls out his contract, you should pull out yours, all right? Because his contract has nothing in it about the benefits that happen for you if he doesn't hold up his end of the contract. I've never seen a contract that says, and I as the contractor, if I'm late delivering my services, will be giving you rebates. <laughs> it doesn't happen. But in big commercial jobs, oh yeah, there, there, are, there are costs associated with not being on time. So the smaller the job, the more homeowners especially tend to look at themselves like, oh, whatever they bring to the table, it's their business. It's, it's, I'll just agree, I'll sign, and I'm covered, I'm protected by the law. To a certain degree you are, but if you're protected by the law, then you've got to go legal recourse to solve your problems. Avoid that. It's a no-win situation. Most renovations that happen in a residential situation, um, the conflicts are underneath a threshold where you're going to small claims court to solve problems. You want to avoid that. Going there is a complete waste of time. You never know what you're going to get. It's not a place to get justice. Protect yourself in advance. So negotiate early. All right. Your contract, you should have a little document and it can be as a, a added to his contract. It should say things like what time he's expected to be at work. All right. How many hours a week he's expected to be on your job site. If he's promising you there that he's every day, have it put in writing, have him sign on to it. Have him sign on the penalties attached to not showing up for work. I know, that sounds strange, but yes. So we got a member here, Lisa sent us solid questions. She said, uh, so what if you want quality? How do you qualify the contractor? Okay. <laughs> Keep listening. <laughs> okay. All right, Lisa, I got an answer for that. I'm going to get through the negotiation part here first, and then I'll, I'll jump right in for that question. Though. That's a great one. We'll, we'll handle that one next. So if you make a list of all the things that you're concerned about and, and penalties are attached to that and you present that to a contractor, the contractor presents his contract, you present yours, you can both sign both documents and you can negotiate. He can say, well, I'm not going to be there every day. And, and then you can say, well, then what am I able to expect from you? Okay. And, and you can move forward from there and come to an agreement that you both have rights and responsibilities and compensation. If the contractor brings his contract only, he's the only one getting compensated. If he screws up, you want it in writing how much you're getting compensated. And guys who aren't willing to take that kind of responsibility aren't going to do a good job for you and have no intention of fulfilling their contract in the first place. Bottom line. I know some of you guys are going to get upset at that, but listen, if you're going to take 200 hours a week worth of work on contracts and you can only work 100 hours a week, you have no intention of fulfilling the other 50% and you know it. 
So stop signing paperwork with people when you aren't going to go and deliver the project. Oof, bit of a rant. Bottom line, a lot of guys in the business out there, they sign contracts all day long and then they go and try to fulfill the labor requirement. Okay, it's backwards. They have no ability to fulfill their contractual obligation to you and you need to protect yourself from that sort of scenario. Negotiate. Next, set up a meeting schedule. If it's a small job, you're gonna meet them on site when they start, you're gonna meet them before they're done. Okay, if it's over a week, you might meet them every morning, you might meet them at the end of the day, but set up a meeting schedule so that the contractor and the homeowner are both gonna be in the same place at the same time, it's agreed upon in writing, and if they miss the meeting, there's a consequence. Okay, you gotta manage your own renovation, even if you hire a company. That's my next rule, manage your own situation. If you can be the general contractor, that's great. We're gonna be going around the country doing seminars next year, teaching people how to do that. If you wanna hire a general contractor, you still need to be actively part of the management process. You need to manage the general contractor. And part of that is setting up a meeting schedule and knowing that they're expected to be at those meetings and be able to be fully accountable to you as for what is going on. Boomer sent two bucks for that question about the timeline on the GC. The timeline on the? On the GC. On the general contractor? Mm -hmm. Giving them a timeline? No, he tossed you two bucks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's nice. Thanks, Boomer. <laughs> Shout out to Boomer. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, next rule for healthy contracting relationships. Do performance evaluations weekly. Now, this is big because there are a lot of contracts out there that go more than a week. Bathroom renovations, kitchen renovations, major projects, right? Do performance evaluation. Sit down and look at your agreement with your contractor as a homeowner and write down everything that they did where they contravened the agreement or things that they're doing that are irritating or causing you stress and grief that aren't covered by the contract and talk to them about it, all right? Good contractors cannot read your mind. There's a lot of personality types who had a lot of different life experiences. There's gonna be times where they're doing things that are driving you crazy and they don't realize they're driving you crazy. And if you communicate effectively and say, hey, this bothers me, a good contractor will make changes and adjustments to reduce the stress level. Because let's face it, guys, life is stressful. And if you enter into renovation and your stress is already up here and you're just like Mount Vesuvius ready to blow, all it takes is for somebody to leave a cigarette butt in the driveway and boom, you go off like a rocket. That's not healthy. So manage your own expectations and your own stress, set a performance evaluation, and what you do in this little weekly meeting is you sit down and you go, here's a list of all of the things. We're having issues, but I'm not gonna get stressed out about the issues because I entered into it with an agreement and there's consequences for these issues. Write down all the back charges. And these are the fees or fines or whatever compensation you expect for all of the times that they didn't answer and fulfill their contract. In the same regard, the contractor should be coming to that meeting going, well, and here are all the extra billings for all the things that weren't covered in the original agreement, okay? Sometimes the contract will say, I have to present that information in advance. Sometimes it says, I'm gonna present it weekly up to a certain threshold, have all these details ironed out in advance so that you can have a calm, reasonable meeting, work out the numbers back and forth, move forward in the project, having reasonable expectations and not getting on each other's nerves. The worst thing you can do is get to the end of the project and end up hating each other because that last payment, yeah, that's a hard check to write. And that's the one the contractor's most afraid of, okay? So keep it healthy, keep it civil, and keep it organized, and you'll be fine. You wanna jump in there with anything? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Archives, we got another question. This is a guy that said he's got a buddy that did a, a portrait or a job or something like that. Sure. He said he's got limited contractors in the area. He's starting a major project. He's planning on being on the job site every day. Mixed reviews on this contractor like he had his buddy before. Mm -hmm. He's really nervous. Do you have any advice for him? The reason I'm giving these advice, is on, advice on contracting, and I'll be honest with you, I think the vast majority, like overwhelming majority of guys that are in the trades or are in business are there because they want to do a good job. They want to deliver a good product and they want to get paid for their services. They're taking a risk showing up that at the end of the job, they're gonna get that last check. And, and I think anybody who's willing to take a risk that at the end of a project, they're gonna get the last check is gonna invest the time and energy it takes to do the job to get paid, all right? 
You can sniff out a, a scoundrel easily enough after the project gets starts, and you don't have to put a whole lot of money on the table to get started. A good contractor always will get paid afterwards, all right? So don't be concerned about that scenario. What was that question again one more time? I feel like I'm bunny trailing. Basically, it's just nervous about... Uh, nervous about mixed reviews. Yeah, all right. Contractors. Mixed reviews happen because people don't have healthy contractual arrangements, okay? Mixed reviews happen when a homeowner hires somebody and they have unreal expectations. They want it fast, cheap, and perfect. And then they get mad and they make a review. <clears throat> There's a lot of mixed reviews out there. The only thing this world doesn't have yet is a review site for contractors to review the homeowner. Because if that happened, there'd be a lot of homeowners who'd be blacklisted from ever hiring anybody. Just saying. Now all the contractors just said high five, amen, and whatever. What? Did yeah. You finish your sentence? No, I'm, amen was good. Okay. Yeah. Talk about the uh, percentage giving up front or throughout the process. Okay. The contract. There's some basic rules with that. The more you release to other people to manage a project for you, the more money you've got to give them. Okay. If you're managing your own job, you're buying your own product. You don't have to give the contractors a dime. There's a lot of contractors out there who don't get paid until a project is complete period on commercial sites. That's normal. There's a lot of contractors out there who want a little security because the contract isn't really enforced until there's been a deposit. 10% is very normal. All right. If they're buying materials for you, then you've got to give them additional funds for those materials. Don't expect them to invest their money on your job. You're financing your own operation. So the more you want to let someone else do all that, the more you're releasing those funds. Bottom line, if you have a lot of materials to buy, don't be afraid to supply them, okay? And the contractors will be like, well, I got a better price. And you're like, well, then why am I giving you full price for the product if you're getting it at half price? All these questions come into play. It's because of the risk. So it's all about risk and reward here. The more you want to save on your budget, the less responsibility you give to the contractor, okay? Now, in the same regard, if it's your job to supply the material, and you don't supply the right amount at the right time on the right day, then it's your responsibility if he shows up and he can't work. So there's a whole lot of give and take there. Mm -hmm. But healthy is 10%. Um, a lot of cases, uh, contractors with good accounts standing at their suppliers don't have to pay for the material up front. Okay? So that's another key. If a contractor has to pay cash for everything as he's going, that means he does not have any money in the bank or he has no credit. A guy with no credit is a dangerous place to give your money. All right. So if a contractor is going to buy $5,000 of the product at a retail level and you have to give him $5,000, he should have an account set up somewhere where he can order it with 30 days to pay. And he'll probably only pay $3,000 for that product. He's taken a risk by ordering it and being responsible for it. So, you know, he deserves that reward. Or you can go and buy it $5,000 of the product yourself. But like I said, you're taking that responsibility on and it can backfire. So I'll give an example of a good and bad contract and sure. the consequences of what they can and should be. Okay. A good and a bad contract and consequences? Mm -hmm. Okay. A bad contract is the one where the contractor is the only one who presents a document. <laughs> That's a bad contract doesn't cover you at all. There's no, no protection for you at all. There's no protection saying he's going to show up, no protection he's going to stay, no protection he's going to manage. There's just none. A good contract mm -hmm. is one that outlines all the details of who's going to be there, what time they're going to be there, how long they're going to be working, and the process for notifying you if anything changes, and the consequences of not maintaining that schedule. And it should be financial. What was the second half of that question? Basically, yeah. Good about you answered it. Okay. You answered it. Yeah. Beautiful. Five rules from contracting. I'm just going to refresh here for people who are joining us late. Negotiate early. Do your own paperwork, right? If you don't negotiate, then the contractor is already in charge of the job. And then you're going to get frustrated later because you should have thought of something that you didn't. Uh, set a meeting schedule to stay on top of the job. Be a part of the management process. It's your home. If you're not, it can run amok. Especially with bigger businesses, management's an issue. These guys are project management. I call them firefighters because all they do is run around all day long trying to solve problems that they cause by not being on site the first time. Do performance evaluations. That's number three. Weekly meetings, recapping, getting a fresh breath, relaxing, eliminating all the stress, getting on the same page is hugely vital. All right. 
takes 15 or 20 minutes, and then you can relax for the weekend. Now, one, two, three, number four. Uh, <laughs> actually, yeah, it's, it's about negotiating. And, and I call it a rule for contracting is have an agreement that they sign. It's one thing to negotiate, it's another thing to actually have a document, okay? Now you can start off with a list. I got 20 points of things that I want you to sign off on and negotiating, you might end up with five that you agree on. Or you might say, well then hit the road, we'll move on to the next guy. Yeah. Boomer sent another two bucks, said awesome job explaining. And uh, someone had a question, would you recommend building a new house and managing the project yourself or get a company to do it? What advice would you give to someone managing the project on their own for the first time? For the first time? And they're buying a house. Okay, so, wow. Uh, advice for someone who wants to manage building a home for the first time. Um, can I just talk real turkey here? If it's your first time building a house, all the contractors that you hire to do the work are going to sniff that out. Okay? And they are taking you to the bank. You are not going to know your processes well enough. You're not going to hire people to show up on the right day in the right order to do the right job. And they're going to come back and say, well, this isn't ready. I got to leave now. I'm charging you for the wasted time. You're going to have a lot of extra wasted costs. What I would suggest is take a, take a course on, on construction technology. Understand the 13 major stages and which one comes first to 13. Know how to manage them. Absorb yourself in information like we're giving on the channel. Go through the history, watch the processes, but more importantly, um, wow, how to get your first building experience? Do an addition first. Before you build a house, do an addition, okay? That covers all 13 major steps. It's not as big a scale. You're living on site. That would be my goal. If I was going to build my first house and I wanted to manage it, that's a real cowboy move. You hire a company, you're losing 30% of the value off the top but at least you can bring your paperwork in and say, here, I'm holding you accountable. A lot of guys want to do, a lot of people want to build their own house, Matt, because they see the money that's going out and they're thinking I can save money. The problem with that is they don't see all the ways that they can lose money doing it too. Yeah. All right. And in the long run, in a lot of cases, you're going to be very disappointed with the result or the budget. So, Make sure that you're negotiating properly. Make sure that when you hire a contractor, you are really tightening the screws to them, okay? You wanna make them sign that paperwork under almost, un, almost under duress, right? You want them to hurt saying, yeah, I'll do it. Because then you know you got them at the price they're gonna be working for everybody else around in town for. Yeah. So let's say hypothetically, you, you know, sorry, you, you wanna buy a house, but you don't wanna go that far because of lack of experience, so you do the addition. What are the 13 major stages that you're talking about? What are you referring to? <laughs> That's another video. It starts with uh, excavating and pouring a foundation, all right? But we're talking about all your different mechanical systems, all your structural framing, your, your thermal barrier, your vapor barrier, air barrier, your electrical systems, uh, all your appliances, your cabinetry, your flooring, your finished carpentry. These are all the different stages. They're all different trades, all right? We'll go into all of those details at a later date. Uh, that'll be another video, but... Uh, one second, I want to get into my fifth rule for having a healthy contracting relationship. I also want to watch the time, if you can let me know. Mm -hmm. We've got 25 minutes. Okay, so we're going to have lots of time for q and I'm going to wrap up the details in just a few minutes, and then we'll jump into it. Okay, number five, the biggest rule, and this is the most important, all right? And, and this never happens nowadays, and I'm going to tell you why we have so many problems with contractor relationships and homeowners. The number five rule is you have to take the time to drive to the contractor's previous job sites, the referrals, and go and look at the work, okay? I'm my biggest rule. I don't care if the contractor and you don't even speak the same language, okay? If you only speak English and your contractor is Hindi, you could have a great guy standing in front of you. All you need is to go see his work or her work. I gotta be careful I'm not being exclusive yeah. here. <laughs> You're okay. I'm, I'm a mankind kind of a man, right? Here's the deal. When you go look at somebody's work, and you'll see this for everybody, a contractor can have a great review from a client online. Oh, the guy was amazing. It's the best job I ever had. Go look at the work. Sometimes you'll look at it and go, holy crap, 
that homeowner has a different expectation and quality than I do. All right? Like, all right? You assuming when you're reading a review that everybody has the same expectation as a finished project, and that is totally not true. All right? Everybody values quality, speed, and dollars differently. And so a homeowner might be off the charts happy with a guy. Maybe it's because when the guy came to do the work at the house, he played with the dog for five minutes every morning. The homeowner loves their dog so much, they're half blind, they can't really see the finishes, but he was so nice to my dog. Best contractor ever, okay? You don't know what's motivating that review. In the same regard, the guy could have done an amazing job had a problem in his family life and had to go to the hospital a couple of times a week over the course of a month. And all you did was get mad that he wasn't there when you came home from lunch, right? And you got ticked off that it took a week longer to finish the project than it would have otherwise, but he did it for the right price and he did an amazing job. And you're still ticked at him and you give him a three out of five or a five out of 10 rating. You don't know where it comes from. Go look at the work, all right? Talk to the people that own the home. And if you're a contractor, stop giving phone numbers. Give addresses. If your clients won't let people come over and look at your work, they're not actually happy with it, all right? And I know today, the world is busy. Nobody wants to say, oh, I gotta put a half a day and go make me, it's worth it, all right? Take a day, go visit three or four of the former clients and talk to these people, especially the one that he's working at right now. That's the best referral. What's his life today? If you go to the job site he's on right now, you go and see. Is it organized? Is it clean? Does he look like he knows what he's doing? Are those homeowners happy with him? Or is the guy a train wreck? Was he good the last five years, but now he's got an addiction problem, his life's upside down, you know, his wife or husband left and the contractor's just going crazy. You don't know until you talk to the people that he's worked for in the past and who he's working for today. That is the best thing that you can do to protect yourself. Ready for some questions? Hit me, baby. All right. Um, what courses would you recommend someone take if they want to learn to DIY? If they want to learn to DIY, the best courses online is at YouTube at Home Renovation DIY. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Seriously, I think there are some community colleges around that will do um, uh, introduction to construction technology and that sort of thing. You can do night courses or weekends with some, some homeowner trade school stuff. There are different opportunities out there. But uh, there's not a lot. And that's one of the things that prompted us to start doing this concept of a tour. We want to be on the road. We're going to do workshops. And we're lining up right now. I was just on the phone the other day with a company. And they're going to be supplying tools for us to do workshops. Okay? We can actually use the tools and try them out. Learn the differences and how to effectively use these things. So then you can decide if that's an investment that you want to make in your homeowner experience. Or, because like when you watch our videos, I do a lot of these things with three or four tools. I try to do that on purpose so you don't have to invest a lot of money to get a project done. But good tools help make the job go easier. So we're going to do workshops and help you. So we got two. First one's pretty quick. Sure. Would you rather pay by the hour or by the job? Personally? Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Um, if the guy has an organized truck and his personal appearance is in good shape, then I'd probably pay by the hour. Uh, because he's got his life together. Mm. But guys who are disorganized, you don't want to pay by the hour because they spend all day long looking for their tape measure and pencil like me. So you want to you want you want you want to you want to get paid by the job. Listen, uh, most situations, pay by the job is great. Like I said, the the different kinds of businesses, the handyman, the guy with the truck, a lot of times they're paid by the hour. There's a company here in town, Matt, that charges $130 an hour for a handyman service. Mm. But that company supplies a vehicle and all the tools and you supply the materials. But again, in that situation, if you don't get something that he needs, he's got to stop, go to the store and come back again. You're paying for that time on the clock. It can be expensive. Mm -hmm. The bigger the job, the more you want contract price. Uh, trying to retile a jetted tub and run a master bath with no DIY experience, you think I can do it myself? Yes, tiling is not difficult. There are some basic rules you got to learn. Um, it's, it's so simple actually, we're going to be filming a how to tile A to Z series coming up. I've set up a studio in my renovated house. I've turned my living room into a studio so that we can film training courses for different trades. All right, we're gonna be filming that I think in the next couple of weeks. We got a couple of weddings going on this summer. Hopefully we'll have that early fall. We can have that released. But the idea is gonna be if you're a homeowner and you wanna tile, we're gonna show you all the ins and outs, 
the degrees of difficulty that you can get involved into. And, and, and the fact is, is it can be simple. We have an HDMI thing going on here. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, cute. If you want to tile on your own, it can be done. And we're going to show you everything you need to know, all the tools, all the tips, all the cutting techniques, and all the knowledge base that you can make good, healthy decision for your experience level. Because if you are brand new at tiling, or you've done some, or you've been at it for years, there's always something new to learn, okay? And so we're gonna do that whole course on that curve so that you can find out where you fit on that curve and then gear your project around your skill set. It's gonna be a real valuable tool because like you can tile a backsplash in your kitchen with a pair of scissors and, and some glue if you buy the right project. And yeah, it's tile, right? Or you have to go out and spend $3,000 on a wet saw in order to do the same project with a different kind of tile. So it really comes down to knowing your comfort zone, knowing your budget for your tool investment, and then picking that project that fits that criteria, I guess. Mm -hmm. So a couple questions here. Sure. Uh, quick one, do you sign contract yourself? And then can you legally write anything you'd like into the contract if the recipient is willing to sign? Well, yeah, that's called negotiation. Now, you have to be careful there because like in Canada, especially, anything you write in a contract, if it's illegal to write it, like if it's against the law, whether you put it in the contract or not, it's still against the law, okay? Um, I'm not exactly sure on legal matters for contracts with, uh, with things in the United States. I think we might do another live show, have our social media lawyer, Ian Corzine, back on again and talk contract law for contractors and homeowners. We might do that specifically at a later date. I know he's interested in doing another live show. So... Maybe actually you can comment on right now and let us know if that's something you'd be interested in, getting the legal take on signing a contract. Uh, there's just a ton of information on that one. Uh, everyone's asking about contracts right now. One guy asked, isn't the money up front a mutual contract and a mutual show of faith? Question mark. Well, yeah, and to a certain degree, until you give somebody money, you can sign all the paperwork in the world, but you don't have a contract without an exchange of finances. Um, if you're not prepared to give somebody a deposit, you're not prepared to do business. So it's kind of a no-brainer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just tons of people are talking about well, this. Well, 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 listen, great. it's Q and A, all right? Uh, we can talk about the color of my socks if you want to. I don't really care. So <laughs> you know, I'll answer the question the best I can with the experience that I've got. Do you sure. have a sample contract? Do I have a sample contract? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do I want to make it available? Not yet. Um, it's something that Ian and I are actually working on together behind the scenes to make these products available. Uh, it's difficult, but we're going to try to create a generic template, okay? I think no matter what contract you get, and you can get them online and download them, no matter what you get, it has to be modified for the state and country that you live in. Mm. So be real careful with saying, oh, I've got a perfect contract, I paid $10 for it. Um, when I was in business, a good contract costs about $500 to $1,000 to get a lawyer to make a good one. And what's that? New member. A new member. Oh, Janine. that's neat. Okay. New member. Oh, Janine. this is the first time we ever saw that. Well, welcome to the membership club. And just as a thought, at 11 o'clock, we're going to start a members only live show where we're going to dig in and be able to troubleshoot problems for contracts mm -hmm. or construction. So if you haven't become a member yet, quick hit the join button in the bottom of your screen or find the link in the description. All right. And sign up real quick so you can be part of that 11 o'clock. We'll call it 11.05 because we're going to want to take a quick little break. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Felipe is wondering if you're it's, if it's cool to run a new gas line from the meter to your stove yourself. From the meter to the stove yourself. Mm -hmm. Is it cool? Here's a here's a great rule of thumb. If you're not sure if it's a good idea to touch something that can blow up your house, then don't touch it. It means you don't have the experience to do it safely. <laughs> you got another new member. <laughs> That's not, I don't even touch my own gas lines, Felipe. Um, there's a time and a place to save money, but that's a great place to be a general contractor. Call up a gas guy, hire him by the hour. He'll be able to do, put that connection together for you in like 60 minutes. 200 bucks and it's done and you're not going to blow up. So another new member. Welcome, Julie. Julia? Julia. Welcome, Julia. Thanks for joining the crew today. That's two. That's all. Well, there you go. This is, this is burning up. Uh <laughs> Best way to mature, uh, to regrade a home. To regrade a home. Okay, we must be talking about the the um, property around a house. 
regrade your home. Well, there's two reasons you're gonna be regrading. One is you live on a hill, and over the years, soil erosion has created a situation where every time it rains, it rains right into the wall. Um, regrading can be uh, digging a trench, putting in French drains. It can also be sometimes you get a new house, and when they built the house, they backfill around the foundation, and they don't pack as they do it. It's a really sloppy process. Mm. They'll just pour a crushed stone, or and they'll just <clears throat> pour it in and pat it down with their hands and walk away thinking they're done. And after a few years, it's settled down six inches, and now the water pools up around the house. And if you haven't got waterproofing on your foundation, you're in trouble. So the best way to regrade, honestly, is just get your get a soil level where you're going from the house and sloping away from the house. And not just sloping away from the house to pool up, but it has somewhere to run, okay? So dig out a couple of inches, create that grade, put in commercial landscaping cloth, all right? And then put something on top of that because that landscaping cloth will divert the water as it's starting to seep through and you have great performance out of that. Uh, you do it in the fall or in late summer when it's not quite so hot, right? You can do it with a shovel and a rake. It's not that tricky. Get a level. You just need one or two degree slope. That's it. Just a couple inches higher on one side than it is four feet away and you'll be fine. How can you repair a bathtub that has a couple of chips? Chips. Call the bathtub guy. There are companies all over North America um, that have got trained technicians in bathtub repair, whether it's steel, fiberglass, or acrylic, okay? They've got special equipment that they bring in, and it's kind of like an airless sprayer, and it's rather toxic. They've got to have real good breathing apparatuses. Mm. But the point is, is they can come in and out of your house in 60 minutes. They can touch up your cracks, repaint the whole tub too, if you want. Uh, tub and crack repair in a lot of cases is less than 200 bucks. So it's definitely worth it if you're concerned. Uh, Boomer actually just became a new member too. Hey, hey, Boomer, months. welcome to the DIY crew, buddy. Uh, someone asked, I noticed you tend to use DeWalt gear mostly. Yeah, well, I bought it. <laughs> I've had DeWalt tools in my gear for a long time. We don't have a, a deal with a tool supplier. Um, so why do you use why DeWalt, do I use DeWalt rather than Ryobi or? Okay, so quick ranking. Why not? From zero to hero. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll do this real quick for you. Um, in the terms of quality, for a homeowner, you might find that uh, tools you use occasionally are good enough to buy a Ryobi or a rigid tool. It's not bad. Um, if you're doing a lot of renovations, you need tools that don't burn out. So you need brushless and you want battery power that lasts. And the introductory tool of that quality level to use consistently on a regular basis is Dwell. They've really got the market cornered for the price point for performance. Now there are better tools than that out there, but for homeowners and most trade guys, like because I did a lot of custom bathroom work when I was in business, uh, I wasn't using a drill all day long, right? If I was doing sheet metal work and all I was doing was screwing down sheet metal, I'd get a Milwaukee drill. Or if all I was doing was drilling holes and running electrical and plumbing all day long, I'd get Milwaukee tools because it's a, it's a higher quality, more performance, more torque, but it's not necessary for your homeowner to go that level. So my personal opinion, DeWalt's a great place to land. If the price point is a little rich for you, be careful you don't buy a substandard DeWalt tool. They do sell lower quality. Go brushless. That's my two cents. Boom. What would you buy do? them all on our Amazon link in the video description and help support the channel. Nice. <laughs> what would you do if, you, uh, if your backyard is on, a, is on a slope and you want to flatten it out, but there's so many roots, what should you do? So many roots. Okay. Most cities have got a um, uh, tool rental center that you can buy uh, pretty decent tractor equipment, okay? Um, you can get a, a, a bucket, usually like eight or nine inch, and you can actually um, excavate the whole backyard with a bucket and it'll eat through the roots. It'll be a no issue. So you can just start digging, pull up all of those roots, and then you can separate it from the dirt, throw them all out, uh, and then you can grade it and build your little retaining wall you can have that equipment. Usually they'll deliver it to your site and drop it off for you and arrange to pick it up when you think you're going to be done. It's something that's the best bang for your buck is actually to rent that on a holiday weekend because you don't pay for the day that the store is closed. So uh, what advice would you have for women choosing contractors? Uh, it's as if they see a woman and the BS starts. They see a woman and the BS starts. Well, I would say that as soon as you educate yourself on what a contract is, and you pull out that form that we're gonna have you fill out and negotiate with your contractor, the BS is over, all right? 
As soon as you set yourself up as a negotiating relationship, you're no longer a servant to that contractor and the BS will stop. When you say, hey, and if you don't hold your weight, you're gonna owe me money and it's right here, sign here or get out of my house and I'll find someone who will, the BS is over, all right? In this world, you'll get respect if you demand it and you will, mm -hmm. so not a worry. Um, it's not about being a woman either. I wanna just clarify this. It's, it's a personality type. A lot of contractors are A-type personality, right? They're, they're like alpha male types. Um, you have, you have a, a agreeable, okay, and you have confrontational personalities. Traditionally, confrontational are men and agreeable are, are women, but there's an overlap. And so you'll have men that are agreeable and women that are confrontational, it's not an issue. But that's why you know, people assume it's a women thing, uh, they get pushed around, the mechanic, contract. It's because you're agreeable. Stop being agreeable. Negotiate a contract. You won't be in an agreeable situation. The most agreeable thing you can do in life is go to the contractor's office and sign the contract there. They all invite you to come over. They got a fancy office set up. Mm -hmm. Maybe donuts and coffee and an espresso machine. Wow. Woo. I feel like I'm, I'm, a mil I'm, I'm an important client. Yeah. They gave me an espresso mat. They sit down and they give you a contract. They say, sign here. Got it all figured out. 52 pages. Everything is lovely. You got a nice little glass office there. They got people coming. Do you need water? Can I get you anything? Mm -hmm. Listen, when you sign a contract in a contractor's office in our country, you don't have the right to change your mind. Even before you write the check. When the ink is on the paper, you've just done your job. You've signed away your responsibility. The best thing you can do is say, come to my house and sign a contract. Because we have contract um, uh, it's like a Consumer Protection Act, okay? If you sign inside your own home, you've got a week to change your mind. Hmm? Mm. That's valuable. So take that to the bank. Uh, just because wondering if repointing a couple of linear feet of bricks myself is a bad idea. No, it's a great idea, Jessica. And we haven't done a video on it yet, but it's not hard. You can buy mortar mix and mix it up in a bucket, right? You get a, a hawk or, or a piece of plywood, put some mortar on it. And you hold it up against the brick and you get your little, it's a long, thin pencil looking metal tool and you just cut off a little bit and slide it into the hole, all right? There, I'm sure there's a video online. There's gotta be this old house pointing tips or something. Yeah. It's not hard at all. It's not rocket science. Go find a good educational video. I think this old house has one and, and you can be fine. This is definitely a do-it-yourself project. Uh, another member from Alan Smith, it's pretty sweet. Oh, another uh, member? Yeah. Oh, hey, welcome to the DIY crew, Alex. Um, Boomer said, uh, how do I prevent subs from dumping material on, uh, from other job sites? I guess he's working in like a new build neighborhood. How do I he's prevent third... subs from dumping garbage from other job sites? Boomer, if it's in your contract, okay, set up a wireless camera on your job site to watch what's going on in the yard. Put it in your contract that dumping material from other jobs on this job site has a fine attached to it. Film that action, okay? You've got every right to have video camera surveillance outside the building without notifi notifying anybody. So feel free to put that up. And you know what? If the contractors see a camera outside the building, they're gonna be a hell of a lot more careful on your job site too. Cheap investment, and you can set that up wireless and send that right to your hard drive, and you'll know what's going on. Uh, so Julie Carter is a new member. She sent you two bucks and said, how easy is it to change out electrical fixtures? Really easy when the power's off. <laughs> um, yeah, we are in the middle of doing a series on electrical. Um, Max, have we released our electrical finishing trim yet? It's coming up soon though, isn't it? Give or take another few weeks? Let's say sometime, August. sometime in August. August okay, September. and what was the name? Julie. Julie. Julie? <laughs> We did a, a video uh, on how to rough in a bathroom, and it was a great video because it covers everything you could possibly wire in a bathroom. We just finished taping the how to finish all of the wiring components of that as well. So if you wait a few weeks, that video will come out. It shows plugs, lights, switches, dimmers, pot lights. It shows how to wire everything, every step. And you, all you gotta do is turn off the power. There's a special tool you can use to test to make sure it's off. So. The, sometimes the label on the breaker panel isn't right. Mm -hmm. All right, don't be surprised. But once the power is off and you can control access to that room to guarantee it stays off, it's the safest thing in the world touching electrical wires. It's actually not that easy. So uh, we got, uh, it's three minutes to 11, but we did start late, so we maybe push it back uh -huh. a little bit. Uh -huh. uh, someone's wondering what kind of socks you're wearing right now. <laughs>
white and one ankle socks. <laughs> there you go, all right? That's what I'd uh, be talking about anything, so. Yeah, if you wanted to recap on your contracts. Okay, so hey, yeah, real, real quick, real, real quick recap. Um, managing expectations and contracting is really the biggest thing you can do. It's something they don't teach until you go to university, but every homeowner needs to know, manage your expectations for yourself and for the contractor. And you do that by putting things in writing, all right? Put everything in, the, in writing, negotiate your contract, manage your contract, manage the people, make sure you have a healthy relationship with the contractor. And I'm telling you right now, the majority of guys out there are not out there to cause you problems. And the ones who are will make themselves obvious by not wanting to be signing things and being accountable, okay? So don't be afraid to hire a contractor. One extra tip that I have, mm. right? If you're a neat freak, and that's not a bad thing, it's a personality type. If you like things organized and meticulous, go and check out the guy's car when he comes to visit you to give the quote. If his office is in the car and it's a disaster, that's what your house is gonna look like while he's working in it, okay? Keep that in mind. If he's a very meticulous, organized individual, and that's how you like your life in your house, and life is stressful and you want someone to like you, check out their vehicle, that'll explain the personality. I know just as many people who want a contractor who's got an office in the car because they're comfortable with that. That's how their desk looks like at, at work too. <laughs> and they know where everything is. So it's really up to you. But number one, negotiate, get it in writing, go see their work, know what you're <laughs> gonna get. Just because Susie was happy with the contractor doesn't mean you will be, all right? All right, thanks a lot for joining guys. We're gonna take a quick bathroom break grab some cold water, and then we're gonna be right back with the members live only show. So you've got a couple minutes. If you want a quick sign up for membership and get in on the action, don't forget if you're a member, send us an email with pictures of your problems at DIY Crew. No, that's the wrong email address. Don't worry about it. If you're a member, send us some pictures. If you wanna know the address, it's in your community tab under members only. I almost slipped that out and gave the whole world the email address. That would have been a bad thing. <laughs> Uh, I'm such a rookie. Okay, so thanks for joining us. We're going to see all the members in just a few minutes. Um, the, the phone app is up and running. Mm -hmm. It's set for 50 cents a minute. I'm so sorry we couldn't make it free, but apparently that's not a doable process. So we'll try to give you a good bang for your buck. If you want to call in and talk about your project, we can do that next. If you want to just talk about your project through the chat, then we can do that too. And if you really want us to be able to see your question and answer it, then throw it in the super chat so it'll increase your opportunity and exposure so we might not miss your question. We'll see how many people are in the video. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next time.